Hi, and welcome to the DroPro segment on reviewing the EL400 mill display. We'll first take a look at the setup menu and then separately explain each of the buttons on the front panel. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the EL400 display head. Now, as we power up the unit, this is the normal screen that we see in our day-to-day -day operations. Notice how ABS and inch are displayed on the bottom row in red. Now, most all of the time, this is the screen that we would be normally looking at. But before we start using the display for the first time, there are a lot of options and functions that we can program to make our machining a whole lot easier. And I should also mention that once we change something in the setup menu, it stays there permanently. And even if we turn the display off, the DRO remembers exactly what we've programmed. In other words, we only need to make these changes once and they'll stay in the DRO's memory forever. All right, so to enter the setup menu, we first need to push the wrench button on the bottom left. And the first thing we see here is the select prompt. It's basically asking us which axis we want to make changes to. So for this tutorial, we'll choose the X axis. Now, you may have already noticed that there are four arrow buttons on the numerical keypad. These arrow buttons allow us to navigate the menu system. The up and down arrow buttons allow us to scroll through all of the available menu options. And you can see here that if you arrow down far enough, the menu simply wraps around back on top of itself, right back to the beginning. All right, so let's go ahead and again select the X-axis button. And so now we're back to linear. Now, the other two arrows on the keypad allow us to scroll through the available choices for each item. So if I push the right arrow button, I can see that I have two choices for my scale types either linear or angular. Now, in the world of digital readouts, there are two types of scales, linear and rotary. Linear, as it sounds, is for measuring movement in a straight line, and rotary is for measuring angular or rotary movement, such as the rotation of a drive shaft. Currently, for all of our kits, all the scales we have are linear scales, so we'll go ahead and leave this set to linear. All right, so to get to the next parameter, we simply arrow down. And here we see SC 5.0. This stands for the scale resolution. And again, if we arrow either left or right, we can see that we have a lot of different options. If we go far enough, it wraps right back on itself. Now, it's very important that this setting exactly matches the resolution of the scales. For our mill kit, we have five micron scales, so we'll go ahead and leave this setting at 5.0. Now the next setting that we see is DP, or display resolution. This controls the display resolution that we see on the display. But unlike the scale resolution we just looked at, here we have some options. If we want to see the best resolution possible, we need to choose the resolution of the scales, or in this case, 5.0. But let's say we're just doing some rough work and we don't really want to see so many decimal points. So let's go ahead and choose 50 microns and see what that gives us. Now in order for this setting to be saved, there's a very specific way we need to exit the setup menu. First, we need to arrow down until just past the sleep option to save change. Next, we push the Enter button, arrow down twice, and then push the Enter button once more. And immediately, we can see that the x-axis display window only has three decimal places instead of the normal four. And if we move our mill, we can see that the x-axis is counting in two thousandths increments, which makes sense because five microns is two ten thousandths, and we just reduced the resolution of our display by a factor of 10. All right, so let's go back into the setup menu and put things back to normal. We'll start by pushing the wrench button. We'll select X. We'll arrow down to the DP or display option 
and then change the display option back to five microns. So let's go ahead and arrow down now to the next option. So RAD is short for radius, and if this was installed on a lathe, we'd probably want to change this to diameter mode like this. But for a mill, we always want to keep a one-to-one -one ratio between the movement of the mill and what the display reads. So we need to put this back to the default of radius. All right, so the next option says left. And if we arrow over to the right, we can see that there are only two options, either left or right. And this part of the menu is where you can change the scale direction or in other words, which way the scale counts more positive and which way the scale counts more negative. Now just remember, the setting here is completely arbitrary. Simply put, if your scale isn't counting positive in the direction you would like, you simply come to this parameter and change it to the opposite value, whichever that may be. All right, so here we have the calibration menu. Calibration is something that you can do, but you don't have to do, as all of our scales are individually calibrated at the factory. But if you truly feel the need to calibrate your scales, this would be the place to do it. Now the good news is that the calibration routine on the EL400 is extremely easy to use and much simpler to do than with glass scales. But again, the scales are calibrated from the factory, so don't think that you have to do this because most folks don't. All right, let's go ahead and arrow down to the next parameter. Now the next option is something that we would recommend to turn on. This option is the encoder fail option. What this does is to warn you if your scales somehow become unplugged from the back of the display. This setting is turned off by default, but we would recommend turning it on. So in order to do that, simply arrow left or right so that the display reads ENF on, and it's now turned on for all the axes on your display. All right, so the next item that we see is the auxiliary function option, and this deals with the auxiliary function menu. This works in conjunction with the optional DB15 connector on the back of the display, which our displays currently do not have. Lock off controls the lock function. If we change this value to lock on, all of the buttons on the front of the display would be turned off, or in other words, they would be inoperative, except of course for the wrench button, which you would need to turn the lock function back off. This feature might be helpful if you were machining a project where you didn't want anyone else to accidentally change any of the settings or values. Now, zero app stands for zero approach. The zero approach function controls the beeping as you get near to your points or move away from them. If we push enter, the first option is to turn zero approach on or off completely. And if we arrow down, now we can enter the distance you want the beeping to start. For this example, we'll enter point zero zero four and then push the enter button. And this brings us to beep tolerance, which controls how far you can move away from a point before the display starts beeping at you. The default is one thousandth, meaning the moment you move away from a point further than that value, the display will start beeping at you. Now for some projects, this will be extremely useful, but for others, you might want to widen this out a little bit. All right, so the next option is beep on, which controls whether the display beeps as you press any of the buttons. Now, most customers find that the beeping is a good confirmation that you've actually pressed a button. But if you want the display to be completely silent, this would be the option that would make that happen. All right, so sleep T is the built-in timer which determines when the display sleeps if no buttons are pushed. 
To change this value, simply push the enter button twice and then enter your desired value. So now we finally get to save change. This is the command that must be used to save any changes that you've made to the setup menu. When you get here, simply push the enter button. And this brings us to the next item, Reset OEM. Reset OEM is used to reset the display to the original equipment manufacturer or OEM settings. This would be helpful if you were the teacher of a shop class with say 20 displays that students would quote unquote fiddle with during the day. At the end of the day, if a display was acting strangely as if someone had tried programming it, you could just simply reset the display back to its original OEM settings. And the next parameter, OEM mod, would allow the user to create their own default settings with which to reset the display to in the above step. So for example, if we wanted to turn the encoder fail option to on by default when we reset the display back in the OEM reset procedure above, then we could do that. In short, it allows us to create our own personal OEM settings. And finally, we get to the end prompt. Again, if we make any changes that we want to keep when we turn the display back on, this is how we want to exit the setup menu. So to do that, simply push the enter button. All right, so here we are back to our original startup screen. So remember, as long as we use the save change and the end prompts to exit the setup menu, everything we've changed will be retained in memory even if we turn the display off. All right, so that's a pretty thorough explanation of the setup menu. So next, let's take a look at some of the function keys or buttons on the front of our display. Now, next to the wrench button is a button with some arrows on it pointing to the right. And if we push it, we can see that ABS is no longer lit, but ink or incremental is. This means the display is now in the incremental mode. And think of the incremental mode as a sort of a scratch pad. As long as we're in incremental mode, we can anytime zero out the display as much as we want and still retain our original ABS zero point. So to get out of it, go ahead and push the ABS incremental button a second time. The next button over to the right is straightforward. It simply switches the display between reading in inches and millimeters. And the next button over is for power out memory. Power out or power off memory allows a user to restore their ABS zero point if the mill is accidentally moved with the power to the DRO switched off. If we push the button, the first thing that we see is home, which allows us to discover the homing reference marks on our magnetic scale. And if we arrow to the right, we see MC ref, which stands for machine reference. This allows us to set a specific position as a reference point in case we need to restore our ABS zero point. And if we again arrow over to the right, we see set MC, which is a procedure for restoring our zero point if a loss of power would occur. And the next button starts the distance to go function. This function allows us to program a set distance to count down to without altering the ABS zero point. Next, the display prompts us to select which axis we'd like to perform the function on. So we'll enter the distance we want to count down to, let's say two, followed by the enter key. And finally, to run the function, we simply push the distance to go function button a second time. And now we can see on the display that we have a leading set of decimals over on the far left, indicating that we're currently in a function mode. So now we move our mill to count down to zero.
All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the next function. Now, to escape out of this function, we simply push the C key. Next, we'll take a look at the eight function keys on the bottom right of the display. Now, to start with, on the 400 series, the top four keys, or buttons, are mil-specific. Now, in order from left to right, they are bolt hole circle, arc contouring, angle hole, and grid hole. Let's go ahead and start with the bolt hole circle. So to start the function, simply push the bolt hole circle button. And the first thing we see is circle for bolt hole circle. But again, this function can also plot points along an arc. So to get that function, we'd simply need to push the right arrow button. And now we can see that the display says arc for bolt hole arc. So to start the bolt hole function, we simply push the enter button. So in the bolt hole function, we can designate an X offset, a Y offset, the radius, the starting angle, and the number of holes. To exit the function, we'll push the C key. Moving along to the next function, we start by pushing the arc contouring button. The arc contouring function allows us to cut an arc of holes on our workpiece. We can designate an X offset, a Y offset, radius, starting angle, ending angle, tool diameter, and finally, whether the cut is along the inside, the outside edge, or even along the middle of the arc. To exit the function, we'll push the C key. And moving along, the next function is the angle hole function. This function allows us to program an equally spaced number of holes set along an angled line. To start the function, we'll simply push the angle hole function button. And again, just like the other functions, we can designate both an X offset and a Y offset. But this function is slightly different in that it allows you to designate the pitch or distance between holes. Now finally, we need to input the angle and the number of holes to complete the programming. To exit the function, we'll push the C key. The next function is the grid hole function. Now, this is very similar to angle hole, but instead of being a single line of holes, this function creates a grid or pocket of holes. To start the function, simply push the grid hole function button. And just like the angle hole, we program the X offset, the Y offset, the pitch of the X axis, the pitch of the Y axis, the angle, and the number of holes. To exit the function, we'll push the C key. All right, and the next function is the calculator function. To start the calculator function, simply press the calculator function button. And just as it sounds, the calculator lets the user perform mathematical computations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and other complex trigonometric functions. Now the calculator function is slightly different. To exit the calculator function, you simply push the calculator button a second time. The next function is the half function. The half function allows the user to find the center point of the workpiece. And all you have to do is simply select the axis that you want to perform the function on. So in this case, we'll push the x-axis button and when we do, we can see that the x-axis value is now half of what it used to be. All right, so the next function is the SDM function. The SDM function allows the user to program up to 199 individual waypoints into system memory. To start the function, simply push the SDM function button. Now the function is going to start in the program mode. This is the mode where the user can program SDM points into memory. Now if we arrow to the right, the run mode is where we recall the SDM points after we've already programmed them. And finally, the learn mode is an alternate SDM programming mode 
that we don't particularly recommend to use as it's not as user-friendly as a program mode, which is much easier and quicker to use. To exit the SDM function, we simply push the C or the clear button. And that brings us to the last of our function buttons on the bottom right-hand corner of the display. But this button actually performs four different features. Let's go ahead and take a look and start by pushing the function button. And if we arrow to the right, we can see that there are four different functions available here. Center of circle, the line hole function, polar coordinate function, and the touch probe function. So let's start with the center of circle function. The center of circle function allows us to find the exact center point of a circle. For example, if we're boring out a cylinder and we need to find the exact center point, this would be the function we'd need to use. The next function is line hole. It's similar to angle hole in that it allows a user to program an equally spaced number of holes along a line. The only exception is that it doesn't allow the user to designate an angle. The line must be aligned with either the X, the Y, or the Z axis. And the next function is the polar coordinate function. It allows you to designate coordinates via the polar coordinate system, whereby points are defined by the distance and angle from a centrally designated point, rather than being defined by the traditional X and Y axis grid that most of us are used to. And finally, the touch probe function allows us to integrate the display with a touch probe. Now, while this function does work with the 400 display, DrowPros recommends upgrading to the 700 series LCD display if you want to use a touch probe. This is because an LCD screen allows a display to visually show where the touch probe is at and also to show the movement of the probe as the machine is moved. Now, because the 400 has an LED screen, it simply doesn't interface with the touch probe as well as a 700 series display would. All right, well, thanks everyone for watching, and that concludes our tour of the EL400 magnetic display. We looked at the setup menu and then separately explained each of the buttons and functions on the front panel. It's easy to use, I've shown you how to do it, and now you can do it too.